great to see such a good crowd here tonight. I think it's, it's important for the public to become educated on the issues and the candidates, and a forum like this gives a good opportunity to find out that information. For those of you that don't know me, I am Tim Belza. I was born and raised here in Marysville. Graduated from Marysville High School, went on to Yuba College, got an AA degree there, transferred to the University of California at Davis. Upon, I got a degree there, in a Bachelor of Science degree in Agricultural Economics. And upon completion there in 1978, I moved back to the area to join my brother in farming partnership. In 1988, I got hit with a little bit of a political bug, and I decided to run for the county supervisor seat for the city of Marysville. I was successful in that election in 1988, and I served in that capacity from 1989 to 1992. At that time, at the end of 1992, with business uh, conflicts and time issues, I decided to not seek a second term on the board, but I found that I was just learning the ropes of California water. I decided at that time to continue on the water agency. I ran for the open seat. One term turned into two terms, turned into three terms, turned into today, and this is where I sit. I'm seeking another term on the Yuba County Water Agency. Thank you. Trevor Matthews, it's your opportunity to take up to 90 seconds for an opening statement. Good evening. Thanks for uh, all of you coming out to learn about important issues. Water, as you may know, is a, a vital issue, not just to California, but to all Californians, especially in the South. I was a proponent back in 91 when there was then water rights to find a way to give water to the people in the South rather than suspend water rights and have the winner take all, which would be the South. I've been involved in water issues my entire life. I uh, was a class of 56 at Fraser High School, a class of 61 at the University of San Francisco. Uh, I had a minor in physics and a, a, a DA and uh, economics. But more importantly, the issue tonight is where the direction of the agency is going. The reason we have these two seats is back in the uh, 80s, the direction of the water agency became a little bit confused. We were able to talk to the water agency to adding two seats to the board, and they were controlled by the reclamation districts and water districts. After about eight years, the retiring supervisors said, we have a better way to we'll elect these people at large. So since that time, it's been a uh, seat usually held by past directors, or pardon me, past supervisors. Thank you very much. I hope you uh, enjoyed the evening. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Does anybody have any cards they'd like to turn in at this time? If so, uh, raise your hand or raise the card in the air and they'll come and uh, collect those. And uh, again, we have a lot of questions that have been turned in in advance, as well as the questions we formulated. We'll try to work in as many questions as we can from the audience as well. And Steve, why don't you go ahead uh, with the first question for Steve, uh, Tim Bilson. Sure. Uh, pretty basic question. Are we going to start with Charlie? Yeah, if you'd like. Start with uh, Mr. Matthews and then Mr. Bilson second. Pretty basic. Basic uh, question. Describe your basic philosophy for how the water agency should be operated, what its ultimate goals should be. Are you in favor of any fundamental changes? What are they and why? The agency was set up to be uh, first flood control and water development. After the end of 50 years, it's found itself a much larger uh, agency as far as revenue. I believe the flood control and water development are still as primary causes, but I believe the next step is for the agency to be a benefit to all of the people of Yuba County. Yes, we were created for flood protection and also for water development. Uh, if you look at the chart that I have back there by my table, there's the depletion in the groundwater uh, resource of Yuba County before surface water was delivered to the south part of the county. Once surface water was delivered to the south part of the county, there's been a dramatic rise in the groundwater basin down there. It now is above historical levels. Flood protection, 
water development, securing the water rights for our local ag community, it's the number one job. And we will continue on the water agency with flood protection and water rights protection. With the new uh, license being in the process of being obtained by Yuba County Water Agency, we will now get in the world of power generation where we will be the recipients of the revenue, and that will help all the citizens. I would like to mention that the questions being asked tonight are asked of both candidates and are not to be directed at one candidate, and that's the way we've done this uh, for quite a few years. So just to let you know, as you formulate your questions, please make it so that both candidates uh, are directed to. Um, okay, Tim, uh, let's ask our next question. How will the agency's potentially vast new revenue stream be utilized? First of all, explain what's coming up as far as revenue streams, and uh, how are the opportunities uh, after funding projects required for licensing, etc. cetera, uh, how should benefits be allocated? What, what should we do with this money, and, and why are we giving it? Okay, yes, uh, up to this point, PG&E has paid all of the operation and maintenance of the project, and they receive the revenue benefits. As of April 30th, well, actually May 1st, the agency now will receive those funds. With that new revenue also comes responsibility for all of the costs associated with the project, and those are quite substantial. We also have quite a few projects on the books to improve uh, flood protection, the ring levy around Marysville, finish that, and many more projects. We will have to continue doing that. At some point in time, the revenue source will get to a point where we will have to actually amend the agency act. Because at this time, we can only spend the revenues on five different areas. Uh, water development, flood protection, environmental, recreation concerns, and uh, water conservation. Those are the only five things we can spend our money on at, at this time. Sure. As Tim said, the revenue bonds paid for the building, the operating, paying off the bonds, and the maintenance. When I was on the water agency, we had two budgets. One funded by PGA for doing the operation, maintenance, and upgrades of the, the uh, power part of the project. The other area was the uh, uh, discretionary money that we got from county taxes and taxpayers paying each year. I would hope the agency would continue that process where they know the income from the uh, revenue from power and the cost of the power are kept separate. From their other obligations. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. So this one will start off with Mr. Matthews. Uh, give us your take on where the agency is with relicensing and what might be in the offing as far as projects related to relicensing. Uh, according to their last uh, audited statement, they twenty million dollars on the relicensing process. I believe it says they think they'll have another four to five million to finish the process. This money came about from the uh, Accord revenues, which is the water sales for the difference between one flows and the Accord flows. Yes, we have uh, signed a purchase power agreement with Shell Energy, and we feel there's going to be some great opportunities to get very creative. One of the reasons we chose a partnership with Shell uh, among seven qualified uh, entities because they, they had such a, a grip on the power industry and such a vast knowledge on how to leverage, how we can get more revenues. Where a basic plan that was turned in by some of the other uh, entities were pretty much just a basic plan. Sell the, the energy and, and move on, take that money and go. With Shell Energy, they provided much more opportunity to increase the uh, revenue stream that over the time of the license uh, that we should we retain, which we will, it will amount to millions of dollars. Okay, we have a question from the audience, um, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Belza. Uh, please explain the process of farmers selling their allocation of water and then pumping groundwater for their farming use. Who gets the money from the sale of the allocated water? Okay, that's a good question. We have uh, had a conjunctive use management plan for groundwater in Newman County since the early 1990s, and uh, 
On certain years when the state is in dire need of more water, uh, we've had a program where farmers have been able to pump the groundwater to raise their crop and forego their service allotment to be sent in the river downstream, picked up by the Delta and sold. Unlike some other areas of the state, we've been very fortunate in the way by we plant our crops 100%. We don't idle 20 to 30 to 40 percent of the crop plant. So this way, we're able to keep the economic engine going for the fertilizer, the crop dusters, the workers, and plant a full allocation. So that money that's pumped in, there is uh, expenses that are taken out of that, uh, management fees and uh, other other fees that are cost to put that transfer together. Then the irrigation district gets that funds, the remaining funds, and then they divide it up amongst their pumpers. Mr. Matthews. As I mentioned in 1991, when they were suspended the water rights, I testified at the hearing. At the end of the second day, we got the order to uh, take that off their agenda and give us 30 days to put our water back together. We came back to the people in Yuba County. Yuba County people did the same. We said, we have to make a mechanism to get water to the people that need it. That's when we started the groundwater exchange. Uh, in last, last year, the, uh, pardon me, in 13 and 14, it amounted to over $60 million. $58 million of that went to the pumpers. $2 million went to the agency. We have a, a, a ballot proposition that we've introduced and we will be going for signatures the end of this week to make a fair distribution of that money to go to the cities and the uh, community at large, plus 25 cents of the taxpayer. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we'll start with Mr. Matthews. There are varying ideas and philosophies on making waters upstream from Bullock's Bar Dam available for salmon, proposed as a trap and haul system. Some quarters are dismissive of that, of that technique and want to see modifications to the dams to allow salmon to move upstream. What are your thoughts? The environmentalists are reaching a way that is not practical, but we have to listen and work with them. It's not something that we will think will happen, but it's something we have to continually work and honor. Yes, the uh, program you're speaking of came out of a, a series of, of meetings and movements that were going on uh, in detriment to the water agency. One of the plans was to get uh, fish above, well, one of the plans was to tear down Eagle Bright Dam. And then another plan was to get fish behind Eagle Bright Dam. And that could have had a devastating uh, consequence to the water agency. So what we did, we got together with the fishery agency and we discussed this plan of reintroducing fish back up into the northern headwaters above Bullard's Bar. The key to that was that we did not want to get any fish trapped between Colgate and um, Englebright because we would own that then. With ESA restrictions, we would own that and would drastically uh, change the way we operate our power system. So we're still looking at this. It's got a long ways to go. It's very expensive, but there are uh, programs going on in the Pacific Northwest where it has some success. So we're going to look at it and see if we can make this work. If not, we'll look for other alternatives. Okay, Chip, um, this is another question from the audience. Can you address the pending lawsuit the YCWA has against the Cordova Irrigation District and the lawsuit that Cordova has against the Water Agency? Well, I'll say what I can say. It is under legal terms right now, but this uh, lawsuit started with Cordova. In 2015, we have all the local irrigation districts get together and develop our groundwater principles and then we meet uh, regularly to see if it is a year that we should transfer water. Last year, seven of the eight irrigation districts said because of hydrologic conditions and because of groundwater levels, that it was not a year to transfer water. Cordova decided that it was a year to transfer water. They moved ahead with an application. They did not finish their application with the principles that they all, Cordova included, put together. And when they were denied their transfer, they decided to sue the water agency. And that's what they've done. One of the worst times of my life to get on this board, to think that one of our local irrigation districts would sue us. If we can't work out our problems with our neighbors, it's a sad day when we have to resort to lawsuits. Charlie? 
put it in perspective, there's 620,000 acre feet in the aquifer north of the Yuba River. That's just between the elevations of 30 feet and 200. Our geologists, using the agency's formulas, showed the 5,000 acre feet out of that 620,000 was infinitesimal, they couldn't measure it. But the agency wanted to make sure that quarter we couldn't bump because we didn't finance or we didn't join their accord. Excuse me, can I go back? I can give you 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. okay. We have assisted Corridor Irrigation District in 11 water transfers. In or outside of the accord, it didn't matter. We have been over backwards to help them. Let me repeat, last year, seven of the eight irrigation districts decided it was not prudent to transfer water. The one decided it was and forced forward. The agency still worked with them to try to help them find a way to do it. It wasn't prudent, it didn't work, they decided to sue us. Mr. Matthews, would you like to reply to that? Yes, yes I would. 30 seconds. The agency was arbitrary and capricious. The amount of water we were asking to pump was exactly the same that our neighbors pumped. And the uh, judge will decide whether it was arbitrary or capricious. Thank you.
who are quite concerned. Since 91, we have monitored their wells, our wells, the wells in the district to the northwest and the district to the southwest. We have a much longer history of getting along with our neighbors with a policy, if you have trouble with your well tonight, we will fix it in the morning. The agency's policy, as we had last year, they said a well ran dry. This fellow had water at, at 55 feet, his pump was set, water standing at 30 feet. Today, he is still not allowed to pump in that well. They wouldn't do the well properly or they wouldn't take another one. Thank you. Yes, uh, there is not a well that I know of that the agency hasn't uh, uh, responded to. However, it's the irrigation districts that are managing the groundwater because they have the wells. We oversee it, and we provide a lot of technical assistance, and that's why we have these meetings where we discuss it over and over again. But it's the individual districts that are closest to work right with those uh, property owners and those well owners, and, and they're the ones that really have to respond. But we oversee and we respond. We don't shy away from any issues. If there's a problem in the groundwater, the agency wants to be on it. Back at you, Mr. Matthews. This well is one mile from our closest production well, and we have six wells within a mile and a half. The closest well to all of it is two miles. But as you know, we were not allowed to pump last year, so Hallwood took over the responsibility of getting this farmer his water back. When I asked the management of the County Water Agency to review it because of the mismanagement, I was told they were handling it. We had nothing to do with it. Another question for the audience. And I, I'd like to put a plug in here to print your questions out as legibly as possible, please. <laughs> Sorry, having trouble with a couple. So I stumble a little bit, so it's probably my fault. <laughs> Do you feel the revenue from water sales should be allocated to all residents of Yuba County, Mr. Matthews? Yes, we are sponsored along with two uh, citizens from Marysville and one from Reclamation District 10 to take water that's more than $110 an acre foot paid to the pumpers and the $15 to the agency take the balance of 25% to the taxpayers, 50 or 25% to the entities like Marysville, Opud, and the uh, balance of 50% to the irrigation district that recharge the aquifer. And if you look at Tim's chart, you'll notice that the recharge of the aquifer is the only reason that people are able to pump. The farmers dug the ditch, but the agency put the water in the ditch. I believe both of them should share. Uh, I'm open to uh, any suggestions, and I think there'll be a proper place and time to debate this issue, and plenty of time left to be on the November ballot. Uh, the thing that I don't think is fair and equitable, that in the proposal that I read, that all of the groundwater that's pumped and sold in this revenue sharing, it applies only to the seven irrigation districts that are part of the Yuba Court. It does not apply to Port Irrigation District. Well, I don't, to me, that doesn't sound fair and equitable. You know, we work on water solutions where we get groups in the room and we may have sharp difference of opinion, we may have battles. But when we come out of that room, we have a solution that's durable, that people can get behind, and is the right decision, is the right thing to do. And we're going to continue to do that on a fair and equitable basis. Cordova has always participated in the community. Cordova has no intention of operating any differently than the issue that we put together. Um, Tim, do you feel that the makeup of the Yuba County Water Agency Board is the way it should be? Should there be five directors and two large representatives? Is that something you would say should continue? Well, my father had a saying, he said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And we have been in the enviable position of having the five county supervisors plus two directors at large. And that extra two directors at large have been an interesting dynamics to help with the county and the water management. There's other water agencies throughout the state that have separated boards where the county is one and water is the other. And it really causes a lot of political infight and battles. And, and other agencies have told us that you guys are a model.
for what's going on in the state, and we appreciate what you're doing. If you look at our voting record, it's 707070. Now, if we were making bad decisions, I would say, you know, we need to have a, a break out of there. But where you get into problems, where you start having four, three, five, two, four, three votes, and a lot of infighting because there may be some problems there with either some egos or some turf battles or something else going on. But when you see an agency that's humming and working like we are and doing the great things we're doing, I think it's working just fine. Charlie? As you know, Portland was the one that made the proposal that the water, uh, two seats, would be controlled by the reclamation districts and the water districts. When retiring supervisors wanted to make it voting at large, we do no, no longer have the input direct from the water boards and the reclamation districts. I think it should go back that way. Rebuttal? Sure, 30 seconds. I don't, I don't know what Charlie keeps talking about these retired supervisors, but as I remember it, the reason that it went to a vote of the people, and it did, it went to a legislative vote, just like these measures that are out here, is because there was so much infighting on the board at that time from these members that were from the 21 uh, agencies that made it up. Nothing prevents any of those people from running for this seat. But there was so much infighting there that people said, we need to open this up to all the citizens of Yuba County, one from the north, one from the south. You're welcome to run for that if you sit on one of those agency boards. And it's been that way ever since. Anything you want to add, Charlie? Yes. The biggest progress the agency made was after the two members from the Reclamation District and Water District. That's when we made our first water sales because we found a way that the state and federal water masters would say we had control of the water. Before that, they said, we just wait and the water will come to us. We'll give you no revenue. It was the Reclamation and Water District representatives that brought this new uh, wealth to the agency. I'm not embarrassed about it at all. That's not correct. <laughs> it was 1991. We'll do another round. It was 1991. You referenced that earlier. I sat on the board of the Yuba County Water Agency in 1991 when we did our first groundwater or our groundwater substitution transfer. I was very involved with the state, very involved with that process. That was 1991. And it didn't restrict any of the other entities still could run for that seat. Final word on this one, Mr. Matthews. Uh, the first time the State Water Project Foundry Crab Packers bought from the agency was in 1985. John Freerink, the retiring uh, head of the Department of Water Resources, then working for Brooklyn Edmonds, helped it put together. I was very much a part of that long before Tim. So that was where the agency came about groundwater. I remember surface water. <laughs> uh, this is a question from the audience, and we'll start with Mr. Matthews. Did I get that right? You got that. Do you support the water initiative titled Groundwater Fairness Act, ballot titled Ordinance for Redistribution of Revenues Resulting from Sales of Water? If so, or if not, why? I was one of the co authors of it. It takes out the uh, infighting and gives what 25% of the income after the pumpers are paid and the agency paid to the taxpayers. It gives another 25% to the designated entities, which are like Reclamation District Number 10, Marysville, Linda, Oakland, City of Wheatland. This is a way we're only distributing the groundwater substitution bucket. We're not distributing power revenues. It's a very good way to start being able to show the people to put the agency together are probably going to receive some rewards. Again, I don't have any problem with the measure, and if it passes the way it should, then that's okay, I have no problem with that. What I do have a problem with, if you exclude certain irrigation districts from paying their fair share, then no, I will not support that. It's got to be equitable and fair to all concerned. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next question, and uh, we'll address it to Tib first. Give us your assessment, good and or bad, of the lower Yuba port. Okay. Thank you, that's a great question. The lower Yuba River Accord is one of the most fantastic things that has happened to Yuba County and the Yuba County Water Agency. It's a clear example where you started off with a bad situation. 
Decision 1644, had it passed by the State Board, would have devastated this region for our water supply. And having gone through these last four years of drought, it would have been uh, short, short supplies. However, by having the accord, we settled that long-standing fight. And what we did was we helped the environment, we helped the farmers, and we helped other parts of the state all in one. It is a model. It has been rewarded. It received the highest award you can receive, the ELO Award by the state of California. And it is a model for the rest of the state. Uh, the Yuba River Accord is best for the environment, the farmer, and all the people of Yuba County. The Accord has definitely made money through the Water Agency. But the way we have managed the Accord, we have left a lot of money on the table. Bullard Bar Dam and Folsom Dam are the same size. Last year was a drought. It took the Folsom Dam down to carry over storage at 120. We have a minimum of 234 at Bullard's. We left it at 400. That, that extra water that we left vacated the dam when we had a rain and had to be spilled. That's income we will never receive. But more importantly, it's water that people desperately needed and we did not allow them to have it. We ordered it. All right. And one more thing. It's not a rebuttal. <laughs> I wonder what It's not a rebuttal. <laughs> it's just a, a one more thing about the Yuba Accord because we had so many fine people working on such a complicated issue and it was a knockdown, drag out battle. But what we did, we became the only water agency in the state of California to have fish water transferred and money received for it. One more thing, Mr. Matthews. The money we left on the table this last year and the results of it were uh, in reverse the accord as negatives to it, the way they call the Fuller's Bar Index. We should not have made some of the Lower bar index decisions had we vetted uh, the the language of the accord more properly. How does the agency balance water allocations for agriculture and environment, etc.? What's your philosophy? Sorry, Mr. Mann. Water rights are a basic uh, right in California. It basically goes the first you use the water and continue to use it have the first right on it. Port of Irrigation District have water rights that go back to 1876. We've been using it ever since. The agency water rights came from a later place. They're dated in 1927. So the agency has to learn to work with the early people as well as the late people. Their culture, the agency, and the water supply contract they wanted us to sign, they wanted us to turn our water rights over them by saying our water can only be used certain ways on our own land, we couldn't use it elsewhere. Obviously, if you own a water right like that, you are not going to get along with the agency. At this day and age, water politics in California are anything but simple. They're very complicated, it's very tough issues, but we have a philosophy and it's worked well. We sit in the room with all the local irrigation districts and we hammer out our water supply. This year, the contracts all came due at the same time, but they all had different types of water contracts. So we've been working very hard to get those contracts in line and, and in the same date line sequence. This year, we didn't get through all the toughest issues, so we had a one-year extension of our water contract and water delivery so that we can make sure we have deliveries to the water districts. Seven of the eight water districts signed that contract this year. One irrigation district has not signed the contract, and that's for the irrigation district. We are proud of the fact that we will defend our water rights. They're ahead of the agencies. They're not going to submit to give them to the agency. The um, state has extended the water conservation dictates through 2017 today. And clearly there's a need for more storage. We, of course, uh, with breaking red lights, we built the Marysville Dam back in the 1960s, early 70s, but that appears to be not a possibility anymore. Are there other things that we should do, such as raising Boards Bar Dam, or 
perhaps uh, having off-stream storage on this side of the valley? Well, I think currently the project that makes the most sense is Sykes Reservoir. It's got the momentum, it's an off-stream storage, it's on the west side of the uh, valley over there, and it, it has the most potential. Uh, the sites here that we have uh, are on the live stream with the Endangered Species Act. We're probably not going to see that, at least not in my lifetime. But Sykes Reservoir has momentum. I think it should be built. Sure. I believe the mission of the agency, flood control and water development, is not necessarily for water development on the other side of this valley. I have good friends over there. I would love to help them. I don't think we should be helping them with the agency's money that belongs to you and Okay, we have time for one more question, Steve. One of the most important functions of the agency is to provide, is to provide flood protection. Tell us your background and involvement, local, state, and federal. In the 1955 flood, I was a junior in high school. We were shoveling sandbags at the railroad tracks at the southeast corner of District 10. And all of a sudden, we noticed the water starting to go south. That was the time the Yuma City levee broke. The levee broke over the top. Two days before, the levee had broken over the top of Nicholas. The last floods we had, the levees had broken from underneath. Had it not been for the Bullard's Bar Dam, the floods we had in 64 and 86 and 97 would have been disastrous to the entire uh, area. I very much believe that being involved in the reclamation districts is one of the keys. I was also in the 55 flood uh, 97. Oh, muck houses out. It's a very sad thing when you go into a house that's only at one or two feet of water. It has six inches of so. I work tirelessly for flood protection. I started with the Yuba Basin project and it continues today. I made several trips to Washington, D.C., testified in front of assembly committees, gone to a countless number of meetings in the evening like this throughout the North State. I've touted the responsibility and to solve the problems we have that we can for flood protection. I'm going to continue to do that. That doesn't stop. It continues. It's ongoing. There's an old saying, there's two kinds of levees. Those that have failed and those that will fail. I want to make sure that we are protected as strong as we can in this county. Thank you. Okay, it's time for uh, closing statements. And each candidate has up to two minutes. You don't have to take all of it if you don't want to. Have up to two minutes for a closing statement, which are start with Charlie Nash. Thank you. Uh, I'm ready. Okay. The issues tonight is where the agency is going to go in the future. As you all know, a board of directors hires management, but the board of directors sets policy. The policy is extremely important and should be set by all of the directors. But when policy gets in the way of uh, where they should be going, it's time to make a change. I've been involved in flood control, water development, farming, all my life. I believe that I can help this change as I've done in the past. As I've mentioned the first water sales when we had John Keyring help us make it. Because before that, the state and federal people of the Delta said, we'll just wait for your water. We don't have to buy it. That made a change. And that change is what started the function of the agency, having the ability to sell and become self-supporting. Before that, they were getting approximately $600,000 a year from the tax, uh, county tax rolls. That's about over $40 million in current dollars. Some of that money should go back to the same taxpayers. We have the chance to do it. We need to do it right. But we can't do it when you have an agency that is not transparent, is not uh, uh, working with the people. They want to control everything. And I don't believe that that is the message and the means to be the way that we can help the county become a better place. We have to change the culture. 
be making sure that we all benefit from the water agency, not just the chosen few, like the $60 million going to less than 100 dollars. That is not the mission the agency should foster. Tim, you have up to two minutes for a closing statement. Thank you. You know, water has been a passion of mine for the last 27 years. In 1991, during another four-year drought, I was going to different meetings around the state. I was seeing how everybody had a quite different perspective on water and water rights than was shared up here in the, in the North State, in particular, Newman County. I came back from one particular meeting and called a couple of friends that I knew on irrigation district boards, and I said, we have to do something about this. We're going to get overrun by the populace of the state if we don't have an organization that will work to protect our water rights. That was the early formation of Northern California Water Association. I was its first chairman for six years. We represent over a million acres of ground in the North Sacramento Valley. And I would invite all of you, if you're interested in water issues, to go on the website of the Northern California Water Association. And you'll see the job that they have been doing to help protect our water rights that we fought so hard for and will continue to fight for. When we had those water hearings in the city in 1644, we organized two busloads of people in the city. They had to move the hearing site, and Art Baggett, the ex-chair of the State Water Resources Control, Control Board, talks to me to this day and says, I can't believe how many people you brought down from your area. I said, well, we're passionate about our water, because water is our lifeblood. And I've given a lot of time to work on this agency, and I want to continue that fight. It's a, it's a wonderful thing, the culture of this agency, we have some of the best people in the state working for this water agency and the culture from top to bottom, from the management down to the frontline workers is again, one of the best in the state. And that's what makes this job enjoyable. When you have the kind of people that work together collaboratively and work to solve tough issues, but do it with a winning attitude and winning spirit, it makes it enjoyable to be on this board. And I hope you've heard enough here tonight that I'll continue to get your vote for four more years on the agency.